Please join me in a moment of prayer. In the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our blessed Redeemer. Amen. It was rally day. The kickoff for a new year of Sunday school. All the teachers, especially the new ones, were scrambling to make sure everything was ready on time. But there was a little problem. All the music for the grand opening lesson was locked up. It had placed in a supply cabinet and locked with a brand new combination lock. The teachers were sure they'd know exactly where to find it. But they found out while their planning had been great, their execution was just a little bit flawed. <coughs> you see, they'd forgotten the combination to the brand new lock. One of the newest teachers was struggling mightily to open the lock. He'd been told the combination, but couldn't quite get it. Finally, he gave up and went to the pastor's study to ask for help. The pastor came into the room and confidently began to turn the dial. But after the first two numbers, she paused. But then an almost glowing look came over her face. She looked serenely heavenward, and her lips moved silently. As she looked at the lock, quickly turned to the final number and opened the cabinet. The Sunday school lesson was saved, and the new teacher was amazed at the pastor's ability to promote divine intervention. I'm in awe of your faith, Pastor, he said. It's really nothing, she said. The combination is on a piece of tape stuck to the ceiling. <laughs> This joke was serviced on a uh, surface call, Aculaph, seems quite appropriate in the light of today's scripture lessons. Since in the earliest days of humanity, people have looked to the heavens for the combination to unlock their solutions and all their problems. In Jeremiah's time, the problem was pretty obvious. Jerusalem was in ruins. The Babylonians had crushed its walls and desecrated the temple. Only a handful of people remained in the city now. Most people, especially the upper classes and the artisans, had been carried off to captivity in Babylon. Jeremiah reassured the exiles. He made clear to them God hadn't been vanquished, damaged. So they looked to God for a solution. They looked upward and searched for a combination to unlock their problems. Jeremiah reassured the people the combination would one day be given to them. The days are surely coming, says the Lord through the prophet, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, though I was their husband. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after these days. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another and say to each other, Know the Lord, for each shall know me from the greatest to the least. And I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The hope fulfilled by Jeremiah's promise words was fulfilled. Assyria conquered Babylon and allowed the exiles to return to Jerusalem, but we're still working for the day and wondering when the day will come when the Lord's law will become written in our hearts, will become such an innate part of our being and is written inside us. Those of us in the Reformed tradition feel a little bit schizophrenic when we think of the idea of God's law being inscribed in our hearts. For our tradition teaches us the law is a delight, a delight showing us our missteps and pointing us back to the way we should go. But why don't we delight in the law? We know we're unable to truly live it. Our Book of Confessions emphasizes this when it describes us as immersed in perverse desires and averse to all good. 
inclined to all evil, not being content with such a wonderful description. The confession and words say we are full of wickedness, distrust, and hatred of God. We are unable to do or even to think anything good of ourselves. Moreover, as we grow older, so by wicked thoughts, words, and deeds committed against God's law, we bring forth corrupt fruit worthy of an evil tree. For this reason, by our own deeds, being subject to the wrath of God, we are liable for just punishment. Sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But our scripture and our confessions point us to our hope. The confessions describe this hope as the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. They tell us Christ's cross and resurrection become personal crisis and present hope when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, God brings God's forgiveness to humans, moves them to respond in faith and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. The gospel, the good news proclaimed by our Lord, calls us to follow Christ's example. And the gospel tells us Christ's summary of the law, the law God, law God still wants to burn into our hearts. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The rabbi Gamaliel, one of Jesus' contemporaries, restated this even more clearly. Love God and don't do to someone else what you don't want done to you. This is the whole law. All the rest of it is commentary. Well, that doesn't sound too hard, does it? Of all we have to do is love our neighbors, and we're almost to the point when we've unlocked the combinations that God's law is written in our hearts. After all, even if our neighbor never cuts the grass and leaves an old junk car in the front yard, it shouldn't be too hard for us to love them. But Jesus, as usual, pushes the envelope. He tells us the ranks of our neighbors include our enemies. We're even supposed to pray for those who persecute us. That means, in other words, our neighbors include the members of Al-Qaeda. And we're supposed to love them. Jesus' comment affects us here in this church. You've begun to reach out to the, your community. The more you reach out, all sorts of people are going to be coming through your doors, and a lot of them will be very different from you. If we take Jesus' words seriously, we need to reach out in love, to serve and embrace all of them, all of them, no matter how different they are from us. Emo Phillips tells a story about our dealing with others. I told you this story before, but in my final days with you, I think it's appropriate to tell it once again. It tells us about how difficult it will be to allow God's law to be written on our hearts. The story takes place on the Golden Gate Bridge. In the story, a man is walking halfway across the bridge. When he's halfway across, he finds to his horror another man about to jump off the bridge and commit suicide. The first man begins a conversation, a desperate try to halt the man's suicide. In the midst of this conversation, the second man says he believes in God. And here we pick up the story. I said, are you a Christian or a Jew? He says, a Christian. Oh, I said, me too. Uh, Protestant or Catholic? He says, Protestant. I said, me too. Uh, what franchise? He says, Baptist. I said, me too. Uh, Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? He says, Northern Baptist. I said, wow, me too. Uh, Northern Conservative Baptist or Northern Liberal Baptist? He says, Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, wow, me too. Uh, Northern, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist or Northern Conservative Reform Baptist. He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist. 
I said, wow, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist, ba Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Eastern region? He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes region. I said, wow, me too. Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council in 1879 or Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. He says, Northern Conservative Fundamentalist Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1912. Oh, I said, die, heretic! And I pushed him off the grid. When we reach the moment when nothing makes us want to cry out, die, heretic, or it's a moral equivalent, then God's love will be written in our hearts. When there's no one, whether Jew, Muslim, or Christian, male or female, confessing church or covenant network, young or old, Protestant or Roman Catholic, conservative or liberal, Republican or, or Democrat or Tea Party, white hair or pink spiked hair accompanied by multiple piercings, when none of these divisions or any of the other ones we endlessly invent to cause us to push another person off the bridge of our lives, then God's word will be written within us. I, I don't know when that day will come. But until it does, Christ's word, words call us to hope, pray, and work when the time when all the earth shall see this covenant. God will put God's law within us, and God will write it on our hearts. God will be our God, and we will be God's people. No longer shall we teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for all shall know God, from the least of us to the greatest. God will forgive our iniquity and remember our sins no more. To God alone be glorified.